morning, guys. Uh, here is uh, HGC back again with you. Uh, we talk, we'll talk about hyper casual games uh, all the day, uh, over um, today. And we have the first speaker came uh, to uh, bring some uh, info for you is Tom Tui, uh, State of Hyper Casual Games in 2022. Uh, Tom is from Sensor Tower. Tom, the stage is yours, please. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alex, and uh, you know, glad to be back at Hyper Games Conference again this year. Um, the presentation that I prepared is obviously about the state of the hyper casual industry. So this is a refresh of a presentation that we did last year. And uh, you know, I'm excited to share some interesting trends that we've observed here at Sensor Tower. So uh, just to kick off, for those who don't know Sensor Tower, we are a mobile intelligence provider based in San Francisco. Uh, we work with some of the major, you know, top gaming publishers in the world, and our data is commonly cited in a lot of major media publications. So, you know, after today's presentation, if you guys are interested in learning more about Sensor Tower or, you know, getting uh, access to this data, please do feel free to reach out to us directly. Um, with that being said, as for the agenda, we're going to break up today's presentation in three different components. The first component is going to be a high level market overview of just the state of things uh, going into 2022. Then we're gonna jump into uh, everyone's favorite topic, uh, hyper casual 2.0, or as many in the industry have called it hybrid casual, quote unquote. And then lastly, some interesting uh, emerging trends and opportunities that we think studios can take advantage of today. So without further ado, uh, I'll go ahead and jump into the state of things. And the first chart that I wanted to showcase is you know, the tremendous growth that we've seen in the hyper casual space over the last few years. So it's probably no secret that 2020 was a banner year for video games. If you look at the right side chart, the overall games category peaked at uh, Q1 and Q2 2020 when everyone was at home due to, to, to the uh, pandemic. And going into 2021, we actually saw a deacceleration, negative 4% growth in total downloads. Um, you can even see that the iOS charts have normalized to pre-pandemic levels where we're, we're getting about 1.8 billion downloads on iOS. Um, but that's a very different story on the hyper-casual space. And so since 2018, hyper-casual has been growing at a double-digit clip. Um, and even last year, as the rest of the industry has deaccelerated, we're still seeing 15% uh, total growth worldwide. And so that's a very impressive number when you put that into the context of what's happening with the broader games. Um, then what we noticed is that uh, within the top five markets for hyper casual, um, you see a lot of emerging markets being popular drivers of growth. So India, Indonesia, and Brazil are showing some of the fastest growth. And, and that makes a lot of sense if you put into the context of you know, just general smartphone adoption and emergence of the mobile economy in those countries. U.S. remains a tier one market, um, but we actually saw a deacceleration growth in the U.S., a negative 5%. Uh, but it still remains one of the most popular places to launch a hyper casual game today. Um, and then uh, lastly on this slide, I think uh, this is a very powerful stat that we saw within our data set. You know, one out of every three downloads was a hyper casual game. You know, 32% of all downloads came from hyper casual, which is insane if you think about it. Um, and in 2021, users spent 58 billion hours playing these types of casual games. That was a 5.1% increase from 2020. Um, and 2020 was that banner year where we were all at home. So just really positive, uh, you know, headwinds, or sorry, tailwinds going to the marketplace. And our forecast is um, that the, the, the market for hyper casuals will continue to grow going to 2023 and beyond. Um, this chart here shows hyper casual in context to all the other uh, game genres. Um, so it really reinforces the, the first few charts that we've already seen. You know, hyper casual is growing at 14.8%. And you can contrast that to the likes of a shooter genre or a casino that saw a major deacceleration in growth. In fact, since Q1 2018, hyper casual games is the only category that's gone 5x more number of downloads per quarter compared to all the other genres. In 2020, some of the genres peaked at 2x, but now we're seeing them come down. Um, so, you know, very, very, very uh, 
optimistic news. But of course, hypercasual in itself is just a very broad term. There's a lot of subgenres that we know that fall into this, you know, uh, umbrella term. And so, in this tree map, um, sensor tower, you know, we used our games taxonomy to identify some of the most popular subgenres within the hypercasual space. Puzzle is a very popular subgenre. Uh, simulation games are popular and traversal games are popular as well. And then even within the subgenres, you have you know, some of the usual suspects, big publishers that do exceedingly well. Um, but one thing that we noticed is you know, it's a very, very competitive space. And oftentimes, whoever is at top in any given quarter or year uh, does commonly get dethroned. So if we look at the, the top charts um, over the last three years, there's almost an emergence of a new app every single time. So in 2019, you know, Fundraise 3D was the most popular yeah, hyper casual game. It was displaced by Tiles Hop. It was then displaced by Bridge Race. And if you look at the top five, every year, you know, four out of five of the top games typically change. And so there is quite a bit of turnover, which just speaks to uh, the popularity as well as the competitiveness in this space. Um, that being said, though, the entire genre does see more and more games uh, reach greater heights. And so this chart from Sensor Tower is showing the number of hyper casual games that are exceeding 1 million downloads, 50 million, and 100 million. And for me, the takeaway is, you know, in 2019, there's only 120 titles that surpassed the 1 million mark. And then one year later, that doubled to 233 titles. And then one year later, that grew by another 50% to over 330 titles that reached at least 1 million. Um, and then of the titles that became super viral and super popular, the 50 million plus mark, we're still getting a healthy number of games. And so the process of making these games has become more democratic. We're seeing more and more publishers, some new names enter the space. Um, and it's just you know a bigger pie growing each and every year. Um, and so then we looked at you know how, how are these games growing so fast? And of course, uh, performance marketing is a very uh, important component to growth when it comes to these types of games. So within Sensor Tower's ad intelligence platform, we're able to look at the share of voice based on impressions for um, among the most popular ad networks. And then we're, we're able to break out you know, what percentage of that share of voice comes from games, and then more specifically, which ones come from hyper casual games. Um, and so this is probably not surprising for, for many on the call uh, or on the conference today, but Bungle, Unity, you know, Iron Source remain very popular destinations to grow your audience. Um, TikTok is a ad network that we see increasingly get more and more of their share of voice coming from hyper casual games. And so we did this report last year and the share of voice among hyper casuals was closer to 14, 15%. One year later, we we're actually seeing 30% of uh, you know, impressions coming from hyper casual games on the TikTok network. That's a really big opportunity for I think a lot of publishers that wanna scale their app. Um, and the creatives are you know, largely the same. So video uh, continues to be a very important uh, video create, uh, sorry, creative asset type, um, but playables has become popular too as well. So if you look at you know, Bungle and Apple 11 specifically, Playables really became popular in, in 2019. And you know, every year after that in 2020 and 2021, we're seeing a slightly larger share of voice being attributed to Playable ads. And so that's a format that works very, very well. Um, and we don't foresee any, any changes in, in, in that going uh, forward for this particular type of game type. Um, our team also looked, uh, or actually we commonly like to look at the, the most popular types of creative trends that, that do well. So um, this is from our December report. Uh, our our you know, team actually looked at what were some of the most popular creatives that hypercasual games ran in the month of December and what kind of insights can we get from it. Um, this was specifically from a game called Water Sword Puzzle. And what our team noticed is you know, more and more often the best performing hyper casual creatives, they sometimes spend the first few seconds of their creatives showcasing a very eye catching uh, video that has nothing to do with the game. So if you look at the right hand side, the egg drops and that egg has nothing to do with the game. And then the gameplay starts. Um, and the gameplay is usually about some kind of failure. And so 
the user in this uh, that's being demoed right now actually fails to achieve the result. And that type of creative uh, seemingly works really, really well in, in hyper casual. Um, same with this next video here. This ranked number you know, 14 on Facebook, 15 on Instagram. It's from an app called Money Rush. Um, you know, this specific advertiser played the, or had the same creative in a horizontal and vertical format. And you can see that as the game goes on, the player is making all the wrong choices. Um, so instead of choosing the correct dollar amount, he seemingly succeeds by making all the incorrect dollar amounts. And uh, that was a, a, one of the highest performing creatives last December. And then finally, um, you know, this is the, the similar format as the first, where the first three seconds of the video is an arrow being pulled out of ballistic gel. There's a catchy line that says, I've tried this 3,333 times, but I still cannot do the math. And so the gameplay happens afterwards. Um, and of course, the player who's playing it isn't doing a great job at math. And so just to kind of summarize um, the first section of what we just went over, you know, what we noticed at Sensor Tower is hyper casual is, is probably the only vertical or the only indice uh, game genre uh, that's in the app stores right now that's still showing growth post the pandemic. Um, we are observing that you know they're still utilizing the usual suspects in terms of ad networks to grow. And then we're seeing a lot more creative iterations, creative testing. Um, but the most successful creatives that we've noticed are usually around failures and then uh, utilizing the first few seconds of those creatives to just you know catch your attention even though the actual gameplay isn't necessarily there. Um, the next portion of today's presentation is going to go around you know hyper casual 2.0 or, or, or the hybrid casual space that everyone's been talking about. Um, and so this chart really depicts the the, the key differences and what we've noticed. Um, in the hyper-casual hyper 1.0 days, and so think about very simple games like Flappy Bird or Flappy Dunk, those were games that had a, had a very short life, uh, life cycle. You typically launched that game, and then you had a very big you know, first couple of months, run a bunch of campaigns, but after a few months, that game is, is dead, and you're on to the next prototype. And so Popular Wars is a great example of that, where if you see the chart on the right-hand side, that blue line plateaus within the first six weeks, and then the developer has moved on to a different game. Um, at around a few years ago, this concept of you know, hybrid casual came along where, you know, what if we built a game that was still simple and, and uh, didn't have too many advanced mechanics, but it had enough advanced mechanics to increase the longevity or life cycle of that app. And maybe we can update it a little bit more. Maybe we can add fresh content and thereby we'd extend its life cycle and accumulate more and more downloads. And so Crowd City is a perfect example of that where even you know, 40, 50 weeks after launch, it's still generating more downloads um, than a typical hyper-casual game would at that same time frame. And we're seeing a lot of these examples in the marketplace today. So um, here are four more examples from Game Jam, Voodoo, Say Games, and Supersonic. You can see that these developers are still updating the app uh, seven, you know, 10, 12 months after the app has launched. And what they're doing is they're introducing new skins, new avatars, uh, new mechanics, um, even, you know, new monetization models. That's helped the game last a lot longer. And it's really uh, helped the performance of that game um, over the over a longer period of time. So uh, the you know, the IO category is, is very popular for, for having games uh, in the hyper casual space that last very, very long. You know, I, IO games are typically, uh, you know, they, they resemble that of like the snake gameplay that we're all familiar with from, from our uh, elementary school days. A lot of the successful types of IO games incorporate PVP mechanics, and that seems to be uh, something that draws, draws in players. And we're also seeing some types of games you know, have a more sophisticated in-app economy, right? Having an in-app economy that promotes uh, in-app purchases, that promotes the use of items, avatars, or skins. We've even seen some games uh, introduce subscription models to remove ads or subscription models to give you more virtual currency or items so that you can improve your gameplay and have a better quality of life. All these are allowing the game to be more, more core and that's really helped the performance, the usage, engagement, retention of, of the app. And that shows up in the data as well. Um, so at Sensor Tower, you know, we, didn't, we didn't just observe this and you know, sub, uh, uh, subjectively come to that conclusion. We actually looked at the top 100 iOS games by downloads in, in Q4, and then we broke it up by the subgenres that exist, you know, .io, 
puzzle, arcade, et cetera. And we looked at which ones had, you know, the most uh, time spent, the most average daily sessions, the best, you know, day, day 30 retention numbers. And it turned out that the IO games were ahead of the pack by quite a large margin. You know, uh, IO games had a day 30 retention of 4.4%, uh, which is far above every other hyper casual subgenre. And then they also had the highest number of, you know, average daily session durations. A lot of that is because uh, those games are being invested in, they're being updated more frequently, and they have more core mechanics. And that's really allowed that subgenre to mimic or resemble that of other types of games. So if you look at this top charts and compare it to the one we previously saw, it's completely different, right? Like Slither.io came out five years ago and it's consistently stayed in the top five for the last five years. Um, Crowd City by Voodoo has been in the top charts for a couple of years. You know, Paper.io has done well for three years. And so this top charts for the IO category, which is still very much hyper casual, is starting to resemble that of the overall games charts. And that's because they've shifted the production cycle to that to, to be a little bit more core versus you know just a typical hyper casual launch and, and forget about it three months later type of model. Um, all right, so the last uh, the last subject we're going to talk about today is uh, is new trends. Um, I feel like you know it wouldn't be fair to talk about 2021 without mentioning Squid Game at least once. So. Um, you know, Squid Game was a global phenomenon, uh, not just in mobile, but I think in the world. Uh, we can all probably safely say that we know someone who dressed up in Squid Games uh, during Halloween. Um, and, you know, the, the, the crazy thing is that TV show came out in September. And within two weeks of that uh, TV show coming out, we already saw, you know, hundreds of hyper casual games being launched in the App Store, some of them that actually made it into the top charts. And so the point I want to make here is, because within the hyper casual space, you know, the, the production of these games don't take a long time. We don't have to spend months and years to build it. Sometimes only a few weeks is required to just get the simple game mechanics down. We can take advantage of global phenomenons, global trends, and take advantage of the hype that's happening. Um, and so again, within a few weeks, hundreds of games have launched based on Squid Games. One month later, after Netflix's series, uh, you know, Netflix came out and said that Squid Games was the most watched television TV show in, in the history of its company. And then by the end of October, we actually had three Squid Game-like games reach the top charts. You had Candy Challenge at number two, we had uh, Cookie Carver at number four, and then we had 456 at number six. And so these three uh, Squid Game-like replica games um, surpass Candy Crush, surpass you know Supercell. It was really amazing to see, and they actually stayed in the top charts for several weeks on hand. And then um, you know, obviously, Mr. Beast uh, is a famous YouTuber who came out with a very long and very good uh, advertisement, you know, influencer marketing campaign for Brawl Stars. And we saw that as soon as that uh, YouTube uh, campaign went out, there's a almost five x increase in downloads for Brawl Stars. So. My takeaway here is take advantage of the shorter production cycles, take advantage of the hype that's going on. And this has been a strategy that's worked for at least some of the developers uh, in the hyper casual space that we, that we saw. So um, in conclusion, uh, we just wanna reiterate that we are very optimistic about the space. Um, we, we're seeing its, its growth. Every year someone has come out and said that, hey, is, is this uh, industry dead? And the answer is no, the industry is definitely not dead. It's just kind of shifted a little bit more. It's an evolving genre. Um, we're probably not going to see as many hyper casual 1.0 games anymore. I think a lot of those ideas have already been played out. I think we're going to go more towards this 2.0 life cycle and maybe even a 3.0 at some point in the future. Um, and then I think trend awareness is going to be uh, increasingly important. So paying attention to pop culture, uh, paying attention to important IPs. Uh, and then figuring out, you know, how does that strategy uh, work well with your studio? Um, in fact, some of the best hyper casual studios that we've seen and worked with, they don't stick to just, you know, one one sort of subgenre. They test out multiple game types. They prototype quite often, um, and they're always, you know, testing out different types of strategies, and that's how they're ultimately able to to be successful. Okay, uh, I think with that, um, that concludes my presentation. And uh, I know we have a few minutes uh, for some Q&A, so I'm happy to take any questions. 
Thank you, Tom. First of all, that was absolutely amazing speech. It was very interesting to follow you uh, with numbers and charts. Thank you so much. Um, I have a couple of uh, questions, actually. Uh, first of, of them is, um, do you have an idea why is ratio in between hyper casual uh, games as and other games genres is so dramatically different from any other media channel? Sorry, I didn't. I didn't quite catch that first part. Uh, uh, when, when you have uh, demonstrated uh, the ratio between um, hyper casual and other games uh, genre uh, ads in uh, different media like TikTok, like YouTube, and other media, uh, some ads uh, channels, uh, the ratio uh, uh, for TikTok was dramatically dif different from any other media. Uh, yeah. the, uh, there's uh, much more um, hyper casual games in TikTok uh, than in any other media. Why is that? Do you have any idea? Yeah. So I think um, you know it's just sort of the nature of the TikTok platform. It's it's arguably the fastest growing app and ad network uh, that's ever existed. Um, so <laughs> there's a lot of hype uh, around TikTok as just an ad advertising platform. I think the types of creative assets that you typically run on creative, uh, sorry, that you run on TikTok work very well for hyper casual, you know, short 15 second addictive videos that have some kind of attention grabber in the beginning. I also think that there's a lot of consolidation happening in the industry. Um, so you see, uh, you know, Zynga buying chart boost, uh, you see Supersonic and Iron Source. Um, and so there's probably some hesitation on putting all your eggs in baskets of your competitors. Um, and then I think there's, you know, probably a decline of some of some sense on networks like Snapchat and Instagram and Facebook that haven't worked as well for the hyper casual space. So um, I'd say a combination of all three of those factors are, are leading to it. And uh, yeah, if you haven't tested on on TikTok yet, uh, we're seeing that as one of the fastest growing ad numbers for for these types of games. Thank you so much. We have some uh, questions from the audience. Uh, how do you see hyper casual games in 2022? Yeah, so I think um, going into 2022, we're going to see uh, exactly what we talked about in, in the previous slide about these 2.0 hybrid types of games. So we're seeing more studios take advantage of IP. Um, I know you know a, a developer out here in, in Vietnam called uh, Game Jam. They like to make hyper casual games that either take take advantage of uh, interesting but not very well known IPs. Like they had the Takashi Six Nine Runner game. They use a lot of uh, top 40s EDM music and their tile tile hops. Um, we're seeing more, you know, PVP elements being introduced. And so those types of games that uh, have, you know, a much a life cycle, let's say one to two years are probably gonna be the more successful hyper casual studios. I think the games that are, are very basic like fidget spinner are, are gonna die out because there's just too much competition now. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question, uh, ads in high, um, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, ads in hyper casual games only belong to other games. This creates a bubble in itself. What are your next resource uh, suggestions for the expansion of this sector? Yeah, that's a that's a that's an interesting one. So that that's the reason why we um, we we wanted to showcase the, the Squid Games influencer marketing campaign because um, I know performance marketing is is probably the best way to scale, but there's other ways to do it, right? So um, you know if you can if you can create a game that you expect has a, a little bit of longer life cycle and you want to invest in it and you know influencer marketing can be one big channel uh, partnerships uh, direct partnerships could be another channel um, so you know, quite frankly that's not it's not an answer that sensor tire has cracked because we don't produce these types of games um, but our observations have been that uh, you know more experimental marketing campaigns outside of just performance marketing can sometimes really move the needle. Thank you so much. The next question is, uh, the easy pop-up uh, ads are pretty annoying, but useful for, uh, to get revenue for the game. Do you suggest there is a workaround for that? Yeah, we've seen, uh, we've seen studios um, introduce a subscription service or you know, re remove ads, uh, buy the subscription, remove ads. That's one way to do it. Um, I think another way of, of thinking about it is that's the reality of these types of games. Um, so that's the trade-off that users kind of give. It's it's uh, you you you're almost accepting of these ads, uh, and you're accepting a disruption in your game experience in return for 
a hit of dopamine. <laughs> um, at least that's how I feel when I play these games and I'm waiting in line at the grocery store. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily see it as a bad thing. And I think the CPIs are low enough where you know, if you get a user to watch at least four or five ads, then you make your money back. Um, so how do you get the most amount of dopamine hits in the first few minutes of gameplay is, is probably how I think about it. Thank you so much. Uh, we have uh, more questions waiting in chat, uh, but uh, our time is over. So I have to thank you and ask you to uh, stay in chat for a little bit longer to answer uh, guys with the text if you can. Uh, we would appreciate that. Uh, guys have a, lots of questions to you. Okay, okay Tom? not a problem. I'll just uh, end by saying that um, yeah, I'm very active on LinkedIn. Uh, so if you guys wanted to connect with me on LinkedIn, I'm happy to answer any questions. And then my email is just my first name, last name at sensortower.com. Uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. And see you, la see you later.